Welcome. It's Monday. Uh, I have here a, a green, very spiky bird. You, you believe that, right? Um, no, we have a, a, a twist, a, a praying mantis, which definitely if they were, were human size would be completely terrifying. Um, uh, another thing that's definitely a bird is this uh, snake um, doing its best to appear like a dangerous viper by kind of pulling its head in, but it's, it's all a trick. Uh, this is in fact a, a non-poisonous bull snake. Uh, one way you can tell is that the pupils are round as opposed to uh, vipers and, and rattlesnakes have vertical pupils. Uh, bull snakes also have eyes kind of more on the side of their head rather than pointed forward. Um, but it's like there are birds. Uh, there's the American pipit. Uh, after it, it finishes this tasty bug snack, it gets curious and uh, moves a little closer to investigate. Uh, still not, still curious, so gets even closer. And it's just like, what is going on over there? All right, so that's, that's today's birds and, and not birds. Um, what questions do you have about the, the lab or functions or conditionals, anything that's on your mind? Yes. I'm not sure what to do um, in the lab. I'm not sure what to do on the, the um, in the if and how I need to change the um, select strategies here in the Corona two. Uh, yes. So, what to do with the select strategies here? So the part of the lab write-up where that is relevant is this is in testing your code. So you don't need to change anything in the select strategies here to correctly implement the lab. Uh, that part is for testing the functions that you have written okay. to make sure that they're doing the right thing. Okay. Um, and so you can change strategy one and strategy two to the name of like the two things that you want to test. When you run the code, it will print out their scores. Uh, just seeing their scores, not necessarily easy to tell if that's correct or not. Uh, so that's what this log uh, thing is. So let me see if I can show you. Yes, so in the, the starter code, I have my betrayer betrayer. And if I run this as is, I just see that the betrayers get scores of negative one. Uh, but if I wanted to see what was really going on, I could change the log to true. And then when I run it, I'm going to get a printout of, for each round of the 100 rounds that, that the simulation plays, what did the first player do, what did the second player do, defect or cooperate. And so this, in particular, this log is what you can use to like look through and around, is my function cooperating or defecting? as I would expect. So uh, uh, that is what the, the select strategies here are, are for, and there's an equivalent um, place in, in Prisoner 3. Does that make sense? Yes. Other questions? All right. We're going to start off with some function mysteries. We have some code. It's doing some things, and we're always wondering what is going to be printed. So this particular example shows something that we haven't seen before, which is that we have a function that returns something, g, and we can call it and then pass its return value to another function call that is f. Uh, and I'm doing it the, the other order. So uh, take a couple minutes and work out what uh, these kind of combined uh, or, or a series of function calls is, is going to do. All right, we're all on board with 
test is going to very nice. Uh, we have the, the for each function call, you can, we can kind of go into the function, figure out what it's going to return, and then plug that number back into wherever that function call uh, was. Uh, any questions on this problem? All right, let's do another function mystery. This time we are actually calling one function from inside another one. All right, please discuss with your neighbor how you went about figuring out what it was what it was going to do, how you would simulate the code in your head. All right. Uh, again, our, uh, we're thinking the uh, in the the right direction here. Um, help me out. What when this code runs? What order are these lines going to execute in? Like which one would be first? Yeah. I think line five and then line six. So when we get to six. Oh, wait, actually, I changed my mind. It would be one and three. Yes, we are going to define our functions as we go, because by the time we get to six, we need to have done def g. So the Python knows what g is when we go to call it in line six. All right, someone else after line six, what's going to happen? Yes. Uh, probably it'll go back to four, um, and then since four calls, uh, like the function at can be two, mm -hmm. and then it would print uh, in the UA. Yeah. So we we go into G and we go into F. Uh, we might also say we have two calls to F. So if we go to line four, that calls F of y, we go to line 2, then we go back to 4, that calls f again, we go back to 2, and then we go back to 6, where we print it out. So, and the question uh, on the quiz that asks about what order are the lines, uh, I'm asking you just to put each line once. But in, kind of, particularly when we have multiple function calls on the same line, we can kind of think of each time we do a function call, we go do the steps in that function and then come back. What are your questions on this example? Yes? Would it go back to four one more time after the last two? Because, it, I don't know, it looks like the equation that way. Yes, that's an excellent point, that after this second call to f of y plus 1, we have a step left to do. We have to add the two results, f, what f of y returned and f of y plus 1 returned. We need to add them together so that we can return the sum for g. So I think very reasonable to say we go back to 4 again and then add these two numbers together and then return that to 6, which then prints it out. Other questions? All right. I would like you to practice writing some code now. Uh, I would like to like you to write a function average grade. It's going to take in three parameters, three different grades, and return the average of these grades. To get the average, you should add up, add them together, and divide by the number of things, which in this case is three. So write a function takes in three different grades and returns the average. And you can uh, work with the folks around you and figure out what that function will look like. <laughs> Thank you.
All right. How how would we start the definition of our of our function average grade? Yes. You do def average underscore grade and then the parameters. We did ten parameters, but there's got to be like a better way, right? Because yeah. So what, what? What? How? How would I write down these these parameters? Yes. I mean, I just specified like for or for, like I did three, had three parameters of like one for each grade, um, and I mean I named mine like per one, per two, per three, for like percentage, but, and then. The yeah, so if we want a function of three parameters, uh, we could kind of give them each a name separated by commas. Uh, if we wanted 10 parameters, you know, we, we could put all, all 10 there and give them all different names. Um, but, if we have 10 parameters, this gets like really annoying to call this function that needs 10 different things. Uh, what if we wanted to average 100 things? Uh, that's just gonna get crazy. And uh, this is a perfect setup for Wednesday's topic, which is let's have lists of things in Python. Let's gather like separate things together in kind of one spot in memory uh, and then give it one name. So we'll see how to how to do that on Wednesday. So you'll have to have to wait in, in anticipation for now. Um, so let's stick with just our, our three parameters. Uh, and someone give me uh, how would we um, how would we proceed with this function that's that's getting our average? Yeah. Ava. You could return per one plus per two plus. Divide that by three, and maybe throw in some parentheses. Yeah, well, with, without parentheses, our division will happen first, and we will get something that is uh, distinctly not the average. Um, yeah, and that's that's all it's going to take. We just have these two lines. We get our three parameters, and then we return return our value. Uh, what are your questions on this? All right, let's bring our knowledge of functions and conditionals together. And let's write a function absolute value. It's going to take in one number, and I would like it to return the absolute value of that number, which means that it should return sort of the, the magnitude of this number without uh, any potential minus sign. So if the number is 5, it would return 5. If the number is negative 7, it would return 7. And so we're just removing, uh, returning the positive version of, of the number. So work with your, uh, with your neighbors to figure out what code you would write in this absolute value function. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about absolute value. So, can uh, someone share what uh, what you did at the as you started this? Yes. Um, so I said if I wanted um, the machine to perform this function, I would just take the negative of a negative number, uh, like the, make it the absolute value. I just want to do an if else thing. So I said if x is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, it's colon return x, else return negative 1 times x. All right. Uh, suggestions for how we can test this function and determine, like, is it giving us the absolute value? Yes. Or we can run it with, and then print, or you can do print absolute value and then put in a negative number. Um, 
Uh, and you know, let's just do a positive value just to make sure. Go ahead and run. And I see what I would expect the absolute value of, of both of these. So it looks like our, our function, at least for this, like one, I guess two inputs that I, I chose, it's, it's doing the right thing. Seems reasonable to assume that it will, will do the right thing in, in general. Um, any other thoughts or, or questions about our, our absolute value? All right. So uh, one more practice for us. I have some, some more code and there are possible things that I've laid out A, B, C, D that might happen. So please take uh, a minute and, and think about uh, what you expect this code to, to do. All right, controversy, I love it. Go ahead and talk to your neighbor, see if you can hash out what this is, is going to do and, and why. All right, we really think that it's going to just have an error. Let's find out. This is, let's go to Python Tutor. Let's go find code. Doesn't like having them. Based out. So defined kilometer to miles, have running, call kilometer to miles with 10 as the parameter, invert to miles, print out the miles. So we do actually make it to this print. And then we come back to the if, and then we get an error about less than not supported between instances of none type and float. So we haven't seen anything about none type before. We have briefly mentioned float. Does anyone know like what thing in this code float would be referring to? Yeah. 26.2. Yeah, 26.2 floats our name for, for decimal, uh, decimal numbers. And so there's something about this, this function that, that I might not approve of. Does anyone see what that is? Yeah. There's no return. There's no return. Number two in my manifesto. Functions should have a return. And this is why. We printed out 620.1, it was very nice, uh, but then the program crashed and we were sad. And the reason we get this particular error, less than and not supported between uh, none type and float, we can, let's add a good tool whenever we're trying to figure out what's going wrong in a program is to print more things out. Like, let's just see what's going on inside. So something weird happened with our kilometers to miles. So let's add a, a print to see what it is that this is returning. Um, maybe help us figure out what's going wrong. So we can go through, we get to the print, we call the function. We get back here and after it printed 16.1, when we got to print miles, it then printed capital N none. And so this is what befalls functions that do not have a return. Because in fact, every function in Python will return something because every function eventually ends. And when a function ends, 
it gets a return value whether it's had a return in it or not. But when you get to the end of a function and there hasn't been a return, Python is like, let me help you out. You didn't, you didn't put in a return, so I'm going to put in a return capital N none. And capital N none is this, just like capital T true or capital S false, it's a special thing in Python that just means the absence of any value. There's just like nothing there. And so none is not like taking up a spot in, in, in memory in this case. It's just saying there is nothing. And when we have nothing and we say is nothing less than 26.2, Python says, I do not know how to do less than between a nothing and a float. And so it just, it gives up. I can't, I can't do it, sorry, I'm done. So when we have a function without a return, it will still return, it just will return none. And so if you are seeing, uh, if, you're, if you're writing Python and you're seeing errors about none type, that, that's, there's something with this capital N none going on. A possible culprit is you meant to return something from a function uh, and you did not. Uh, what are your questions on this? All right. So, uh, I have another task for you. Let's assume that we want to write a number guessing game. And we're going to have a, this game is going to be a game that you play with a computer, say. And let's just assume that we already have two variables, one called guess. And the other called secret, where guess is what the player has, has guessed try, uh, in, in their attempt, and secret is the number they're trying to guess. And your task is to print a hint based on you know, how close their guess is to the, to the secret. Um, if it's exactly you should print winner. If it's close, and you get to decide how close counts as close, print lava. If it's close-ish, not, not lava close, but you know not super far away, print warm. Otherwise, print cold. So I would like you to work with folks around you to assume you have these variables guess and secret to write code that's going to use those to print out the appropriate hint or winner if the guess is is correct questions on on this task before you get started yeah Gabby. are we assuming that guess and secret are like numbers like okay. yes guess and secret are two numbers okay. Coding up this uh, guessing game. So I wrote some comments here, as I often do, to sort of, kind of write down the logical structure of the program before I start writing any code. This so is sort of organized in, in my head. Uh, so first I wanted to, to say, uh, to, to check whether uh, the guess is correct. Uh, so I think I want to use an if statement um, to, to check whether something uh, is, is true, how would I check that uh, they guessed correctly? Yes? If guess equals equals 
yeah, if the two, if the two are equal, then they guess correctly, and I want to print winner. All right, now I want to print uh, uh, whether, uh, I, I want to check is the guess uh, within five uh, of, the, of the secret. This is what I've decided lava, lava means. So how would I write down some sort of condition for, uh, for that? Uh, someone want to share the, the approach you, you took? Yeah. Well, I started with absolute value, or ABS, and then in parentheses, guess minus secret is um, less than a number. Mm -hmm. I chose three. Yeah, I have, I've chosen five. This, this, looks, uh, this looks great. Um, sorry? Oh, uh, with the colon. Uh, with, with a colon, did you put something before the, the ABS? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, well, I did elif. Yeah, so elif, if guess and secret are within five of each other, is the, if the difference of them is less than five, that's when I would print uh, lava. Uh, so good suggestion to use elif. Uh, what if I had put if here? Is, is that still going to work? Is there anything that, that I might not like about what using having both of these be if? Yes? Um, I think it'll print both of them if guess equals secret because then both conditions are met. Exactly. But if, I, if I have them both as if, I'll check the first, they're equal, winner, and then I'll check the second. Well, if they're equal, they're also within five, and I'll print log. So here the the elif is useful because in a sequence of if and then some number of elifs, as soon as one, the first condition that's true, I'm going to skip all the rest. And so using if elif is how I'm going to make sure to only print one thing. Otherwise, I might end up printing like all, all the hints. Does that, does that make sense? Any questions about why we need elif here? And I could use the same strategy for uh, printing out warm, which I've said is within 10. And then my comment says that we're printing uh, cold the old fashioned way, cold day. Sure, that's accurate old English. No one look it up. Um, all right, so I have I have a program that's going to print out exactly one one hint. Um, any questions on on using if and elif and else to do this? Yeah, mom. Does this violate my manifesto? Um, possibly. What do you think might violate the manifesto? So uh, I am adamant that when you write a function, you want to return and not print. As I've written it here, I have not put this inside of a function. This is just like a program that I'm going to run and it's going to print something. But absolutely, if I wanted to make a function that returns a hint for me to print, so if and I saw I saw some folks uh, uh, doing exactly that. If I wanted to say def get hint and make guess and secret parameters to that. In VS Code, I can select a bunch of code and hit tab, and it will move all the lines over, which is very useful. Then, yes, not to avoid violating my manifesto, I would then, once this was inside a function, I want to return instead of print, and then I might say print get hint uh, guess and secret. So that's how I might kind of use a function uh, uh, to do this. Uh, and particularly if we if we want to give multiple hints and like the player is guessing multiple times, 
uh, putting this code in a function that we can reuse might be helpful. Yeah, Rebecca. If you're having a script, you have to use the print to um, see what the return value is in a terminal? Yes, so this is a, a, a great question. Um, if we want to see the return value for the function, uh, return does send the data somewhere, but it sends it to some other place within the program. And the only way that we have to send data to a place where we can see it is print, to tell the computer, hey, take whatever this is and send it to the screen. Other questions? All right, so I want to make this guessing game kind of actually work um, as opposed to just assuming that we have guess in secret. So let's talk about how we could go about that. Uh, so there are two parts to this. For guess, we want to generate a random number. Right, that's how we're going to start the game. We're going to pick some, sorry, not guess. What am I saying? For secret, for the secret thing that someone is trying to guess, we want to generate a random number. If, because if we just say, I don't know, pick seven, then every time you play the game, the secret number is seven, and you play it twice, and you're like, well, this, is, this has been fun, but I don't need to do this anymore. Uh, so we want to generate a random number for a secret. And for the guess, we're going to get user input. We're going to ask whoever is using this program to tell us what their guess is. So let's do the user input part first. There is a built-in function in Python appropriately named input. And input takes as a parameter the prompt to display to the user before they enter their input. So I might say, enter your guess, colon, and then a space. So when I run this program, I see enter your guess, and the program pauses and now is waiting for me to enter some input before continuing. So I say 145. Program continues, and we get to down here where I have an undefined variable guess. So maybe I should take what input is returning, which is whatever the user entered, and assign it to a variable. Guess seems like, like a good one. And this input function is going to return whatever the user types in, and that's what gets assigned to guess. So we can get user input uh, with the input function. And as you may have seen in the lab, we can import random to get a random number. This random module, like uh, the math module, has a bunch of different functions inside of it that we can, that we can use. Uh, and I'll use the rand int function, with which VS Code is helpfully telling me takes an A and a B, two parameters, and gives me a random integer in that range. So give me a random integer between 1 and 100, including both 1 and 100. And I better assign that to a variable. Now I have secret and guess have a, have a, uh, on the precipice of having a real guessing game of some kind. So I can run this. I enter a guess, and I guess 43. And... Uh, uh, I'm not, not out of the woods yet. I have encountered a type error. 
And this is sort of like the type error we saw before, where it was like unsupported, none type, and float. This says unsupported upper end types for minus, and it's showing me the line. So this is when I do guess minus secret, and it says str and int. In in Python, int is Python's name for an integer or whole number. And we've seen that float is Python's weird name for a decimal number. And so it's saying int and str. str is a kind of thing that we haven't talked about, but we have actually used a lot. str is short for string, another sort of uh, like float, kind of weird historical term that computer science has has acquired, and a string is short for a string, a sequence of characters, characters meaning letters, and so this is text. STR is what Python calls text. which we've been using since the beginning of the course by putting some, uh, some text inside double quotes. And this is what's known as a string, or str, str, for short. And so now we can decode this error message and say that it doesn't know how to subtract between a string and an int, which makes sense. We have some text, we have a number, we don't know how to do subtraction with those two things. Anyone have uh, a guess as to where this, uh, where this problem of, of having a, a string is coming from? Yeah? So we're typing the, our input, we're treating it as a string. Exactly right. That when we put in our input to that input function, I said it returns the user's input. It returns it as text, as a string. This is very good. In the old Python, Python 2, the input function would uh, take whatever the user typed and run that as Python code, which meant if the user typed a number, it would like run it and come out as a number. So that's good. But if the user typed Python code to delete your hard drive, you know, it would run that too, which has obvious security problems. <laughs> so in Python 3, they fix this to make input return text. So it doesn't automatically, without any sort of checking, run whatever mal the malicious user happens to type in. But since it returns it as text, we need to convert it into a number. And we can do this with this int. There's these names that I've been introducing for different kinds of data in Python, the int, stir, float. These are also functions in Python that can convert one type of data into that type of data. So if I want to convert guess to an integer, I would say guess equals int of guess. And this int function will take uh, whatever is in, in guess and uh, attempt to turn it into an integer. I can click the, the arrow in the upper right, run the program, type 43. Ah, it was log. I was very close. If I just type something else like, huh, I'm going to get an error on this guess equals int of guess. And it says, uh, you know, I really couldn't turn huh into an integer. No luck. But as long as I enter a number, 
this will turn it into an integer and it will be able to, to print out a hint. All right, what are your, what are your questions on this uh, randomness or, or user input or strings or, or anything we've talked about? <clears throat> Gary? Um, mine is only returning the winner to me. Now that we've done all the, the stuff. It wasn't when I just had done it, like, assuming that we Um. Yeah, uh, I, I'd be happy to, to take a look. Um, other other questions? Yes. Um, will the number change every time you like, play it? That we can find out by just having it reveal its secrets each time. So it's 17. I'm a winner. <laughs> it's 98. Oh, I'm so good at guessing. 80, yeah, so every time we run the program, it's going to, to be different. So how this actually works uh, in, in Python uh, and in computing in general is that this uh, random thing that we import is actually providing what are called pseudo-random numbers. Because when we ask for a random number, based on some initial value, this random number generator will start repeating its sequence of random numbers. But fortunately, it will start repeating after 2 to the 19,997 minus 1 random numbers. But it's not true randomness. It can't give us kind of uh, an infinite amount of uh, random things. But you know, it can give us a lot of, of random numbers before it starts to repeat. And every time we run the program, it initializes. It starts off this random number generation with a different value, which is how it gets, uh, which is how we get a sort of different sequence of this many random numbers uh, every time. Other questions? All right. I want to show you one last bit of uh, weirdness before we end for today. Uh, and that is uh, the, the treachery of the float in Python. So you would think that uh, were I to print out uh, 0 0.1 times 2.5 times 1.5, and then print out those same three numbers multiplied together, but just change the order, you would expect that these would print out the same thing. This is, you know, what what math uh, math would tell us. Let me add some spaces in here. But when I run the program, I do see the same thing. <laughs> Python is is a uh, being interesting today. All right. Let's see. So we do see the same thing. But are these actually equal? They are equal. <laughs> That's good news. Curious if I put parentheses. Now they're not equal. So Python is doing some, this, would, this I, I hadn't actually seen before. Uh, in the background, Python is actually arranging this multiplication because it's supposed to be equivalent if you change the order of the multiplication. It's arranging it so that it gives us the nice even 0.375. But when I force it 
to do the multiplication in the order I, uh, in a particular order, then, oh, I think I just, yes, I just mistyped it. I meant to do the 0.1 times the 0.15, but when I do the multiplication in a certain order, I get only very, very close to 0.375 in one of these. I mean that the, like I'm within like quintillionths of 0.375, but I'm not quite there. So we're out of time, but in short, this is because the computer is approximating these floating point numbers. It's not able to be uh, uh, infinitely precise. And so when, in fact, when I do 0.1 times 0.15, it can only approximate very, very close to that. And so when we're working with floating point numbers, uh, it's important to keep in mind that this sort of approximation error can, can creep in. Uh, I'll have more to say about this in a, in a future topic, but that'll do it for today. Keep working on lab one, post questions on the forms. I have office hours tomorrow night in the lab. The quiz is due tonight. And I'll see you on Wednesday.